हेलो प्रोफेसर बोस आई थिंक देर इज सम इंटरनेट कनेक्टिविटी प्रॉब्लम फ्रॉम ब्रदर बोस सो प्रोफेसर बोस कैन यू हेयर मी please please unmute professor bos please unmute your audio yeah i have already yeah. unmuted now now please start okay so first uh, talk is given by uh, given by birendra pandey uh, birendra pandey are you here oh i'm here i'm looking at you okay thank you very much Good morning. Good morning. How so, are you? So, uh, uh, his title of talk is "Exoplanet Migration in Magnetized Disk." So, uh, he is from Macquarie University, Sydney, Australia, and um, I welcome you to start your talk, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. In spite of having so many teething problems, we are on track now, and yeah. to be addressing the plasma physics formality at large and maybe the astrophysicist about this emerging branch of astrophysics why i call it uh, call this emerging branch if you look before 1990s there was nothing on this subject i mean even the research in planetary uh, origin of a planet uh, building was not considered a very respectable branch frankly and except for some very iconic institutes this research was never mainstream so what happened in 1990s from starting from 1989 that planets outside our solar system were observed seen and that kind of galvanized or motivated for a very important mission by nasa in 2009 that was kepler the mission itself was ca called kepler uh, and that mission actually its main goal was to look for exoplanets or planets outside uh, you know our solar system so basically to detect uh, well the whole motivation is whether we are alone our planetary system is unique and well as a human do we have any companion elsewhere even that is at the back of our mind so all that led to this research of course i have slightly modified the title of the talk from exoplanet in a magnetized disk or migration to ex exoplanets and their migration actually i should have also added formation because as you as the talk uh, goes goes you will see that the migration formation etc these are all co questions closely linked so let us see on the second slide hopefully and well, i can do it down so i don't know go to the second page i can go here and tell you that on the second page of my slide yeah go up go up, up yeah second one next next so the second slide you can see that actually this is a picture taken from or the plot taken from nasa nasa which tells you the number of exoplanets discovered since 1989 can we have the second slide please yeah please down please down not coming up oh yeah yeah this yeah. one so can you see this this uh, graph tells you the number of exoplanets discovered till 2016 i mean this is a uh, this plot is of level in nasa i mean somewhere in the exoplanet archive and you can see about 4300 4300 planets have been discovered so far so what is interesting about it well to warn you if we were on some exoplanet and if we were observing our solar system only planet we would have discovered with our current technology is jupiter so immediately your anticipation is that jupiter will be the jupiter like planet will be dominating the exoplanet population so let us go to the next slide and on the next slide you can see immediately 
the year of discovery versus mass, mass versus year of discovery. And here you see uh, the lines, Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter. So it tells you there is plenty of uh, population of uh, every planet. Which, yes, please. Okay. Uh, so sorry, sorry. Go back. Go back to that. So the plenty of exoplanets which are kind of uh, of mass or or larger than Jupiter. There are a couple of things. Can we go to the previous slide? Actually, I did not complete the previous slide. So yeah, no, no, no. Go to the previous slide. Back, backward, backward. You are going forward. Yeah, this one. So you see, the first exoplanet was discovered about 89, uh, 1988, 89. And then you have on that line about the third planet above Jupiter. And this was the planet which caused this, uh, you know, uh, sensation actually that, oh, there will be more planets. And then come Meyer and Quillon's 1995 uh, uh, planet, which actually got them a Nobel Prize, which is here. So, you see all these planets which are coming here are pretty much large planets. The planet of the our size, Earth size is fewer than the planet which are of Neptune, Neptune or Jupiter size. To give you a sense of perspective, Jupiter is about 300 times bigger than Earth. Neptune is about 10 times, 14 times, I think, bigger than Earth, mass-wise. So you see, Massive planets are galore. I mean, they are in too many numbers. Earth planets are few in between. Let us go to the next, next slide, which tells us about something more important. What is that? You know, you can see here at the near x-axis, Venus, Earth written. So these are the planets orbit, orbital distance. So if you imagine Earth is at one, Venus is at about 0.7. These are astronomical units I'm talking about, which is about 10 to the power 13 or so uh, centimeter. Or if you want to remember what is an astronomical unit, it is the distance traveled by light in eight minutes. So light from sun to earth comes in eight minutes, okay? So that is your one astronomical unit. So earth is here. And what is surprising and shockingly surprising that most of these massive planets are very, very close to their star. Now, how is that possible? If you look at our knowledge, I mean, we are challenged here because if you look at Jupiter in our solar system, I will come there also, that is somewhere about 5 AU. So on this plot, it will be between 1 and 10 somewhere. I mean, the picture shows you Jupiter here, Jupiter, Saturn. This is the typical or Uranus, Neptune here on the top corner right hand side. So you see that these planets actually, the planets which are very close to their star, how did they got there? I mean, you can't have so much mass actually. This is the first reaction. You can't have so much mass very close to their star. Why is that? Well, that is because if when the star forms, actually there will be the photo light, so much light, so much photo evaporation that the matter will be blown away by the heat, by the, by the light. So expectation would be that if at all there is any planet which is at a tighter orbit than even Mercury, Mercury is at 0.4, even tighter orbit than Mercury of the size of Jupiter, it must have got there by some other means. By what? And that is the, that is the point of this talk, that the point is that they must have got there migrating few thousand or few hundred AU in a space because there was there is no conducive environment so close to a star that these planets are going to survive. So what did they do? They got formed somewhere else, maybe at a distance where Jupiter is now or maybe further out where Uranus and Neptune is. And they slowly migrated into the disk. Of course, they formed in the disk, migrated in the disk and came close to the star. Okay, so let us go to the next slide, please. All right, so you see here mass ratio versus period. And again, you see V and E is for Venus and Earth. And then all these red dots are your solar system satellites, you know, and J is in the corner is for Jupiter. But then there is a whole lot of population where these hot Jupiters, they are going around their native star 
in less than a day, I mean, in less than three, four days, or even a day or two. Whereas they also have eccentric giants, which are kind of normal ones, which are further out, and they are kind of going around their own star in thousand days or more. So the point is, further you are, you are fine because you will take longer to go around. Like Jupiter takes 12 years, we take one year, Mars take about close to two years. But when you go to Venus, Venus takes about what, 220 days or so? And Mercury takes about 80, 90 days, about three months to go around the sun. So, but in this case, you see the hot Jupiters are kind of, uh, well, less than even 10, 10 days. So this kind of reinforces, reinforces our view that actually we are looking at something which, about which we had no clue, no idea, no understanding whatsoever till 1990s, till 2000, 2010. So that means we are starting a completely, completely new branch of astrophysics. This reinforces the point. Okay, let us go to the next slide, please. So, and here is the number of planets. Well, you could say following thing, and this is always the thing, you know, astrophysics given the uncertainty, you could say, well, it could be so that when the self-gravity caused the star formation, some of this matter was left behind, but there was enough matter that deuterium fusion, deuterium burning took place. And these are not planets, but these are kind of a star, a small star, brown dwarf, they qualify as, you know, they are called brown dwarfs. So there might be those uh, star things, they are not planet. But unfortunately, I mean, as we will see later again in the slide, that between 13 so Jupiter mass to 80 Jupiter mass, there is a desert. There is no brown dwarf. So that does not quite go well because you don't want to have new theories at every step. You know, that means your theory is totally discredited. If, if you have a theory which, which, which requires every now and then modification at every stage. So this, uh, this plot tells you that, look, these, these uh, giant planets, hot Jupiters, are actually a new kind of, uh, you know, uh, planetary thing, which has happened in the disk and migrated several hundred ages near to their star, you know, or possibly, you know, so far as we understand. Again, you have to put this last line so far as we understand, because in astrophysics, given the certainty, you know, something which we are very sure may go wrong very quickly. So you have to, with a word of caution, you have to approach this. But one thing is certain, these are not brown dwarfs, but these are planets of 10 Jupiter, uh, uh, 5 Jupiter, 20 Jupiter size, uh, actually, things. You know, not 20, 15 Jupiter is the maximum, so 15 Jupiter. So go ahead with the properties of exoplanet. In the next slide, I show you that actually, there is a direct correlation between metallicity of the star and the number of planets it has. What does it mean for a plasma physicist? It means planet will have, the star will have more metal if it is old. Sun is a G type of star, Sun is a middle aged star. I mean, it has about half of its life is over, it's about half of its life it has uh, gone, you know. So it must have cooked some iron in the soul, in the, in the core. So that means as it grows old, there will be more and more iron in the star. But as it grows old, also if it has a disk, disk will have more time for planet to form. So if this logic is valid, then that means the star with more higher metal ratio Fe over H compared to sun should have more, more kind of planets. And this is a paper by Fisher and Valenti about 2004 who do these kind of things. But you may ask quickly, hey, you are giving me too many parameters, what the heck? The point is you are looking, you are like a blind man with an elephant. So whatever comes, uh, you know, that these correlations kind of give you the indication, you know, what not to look for and what are the places to look for really these stars. So that way, come to the next one. So can I summarize quickly, what are these exoplanets? Well, almost all stars, I mean, this is a review was written in 2015 by, you know, this Laughlin and Lissaur, 
which says that about 50% of solar type star have a group number. But imagine that, you know, there is not one planetary system solar type, uh, but there could be multiple of them. And then most exoplanets have eccentric orbit. What does it mean? If you look at the, our planetary system, our planetary, planetary system is by basically consists of planets which have circular orbit. So eccentric, eccentricity is close to, close to zero except for Mercury. So most of the, the planets are in the solar plane, you know, in the plane uh, they are rotating. Whereas in the case of exoplanet, their orbits are pretty much uh, uh, further away, very away from the circular orbit. And hot Jupiter are not that common actually. At a distance of 0.1 AU, they are only 1% of them, you know, there, but they are there. And giant planet, of course, there is a correlation between metallic metallicity with increasing metallicity, the giant planet, number of giant planet increases. However, for the small planet, there is no such uh, correlation. And of course, planets also form in binary systems. You know, binary systems are systems where pair of a star form together, I mean, are take, uh, go around each other. So those are called binary systems. So planets do form radially in binary systems. So these are roughly the properties of a binary system. Now, what are the categories in which, can we go to the next slide, please? So observed exoplanets broadly fall into two groups. I mean, this is a paper by Lisa and Laughlin in 2015. So if you want to catch with the, uh, catch with the exoplanet story, you can always look at the Astro PH archive and this paper is readily available. So they actually categorized the exoplanet in following categories, hot Jupiter. There could be temperature of the surface of a hot Jupiter could be about 3000 or so K. You know, the sun's surface temperature is 5000 K for a reference, uh, you know, or something like a star. And period is few days, eccentric giants. So they have per period of 100 to 10,000 or 1,000 days. Then there are planets which fall in the range of one to 50 solar solar mass and period of few months. And further, there could be branching between giant and subgiant. And they could be found on the orbit. Jupiter-like planet can be found on the orbit, which is very, very tight. So it is very close to their host star. So this is broadly the, the state of the play now. This is broadly the picture you have got. So what are the questions then? So come back to that in the next slide. So, can we... so this is our solar system. Of course, we immediately feel relieved and happy and not without reason when Newton saw it, he said God must have created it because it was so harmonized. What a beautiful part of it. Well, as I had already told you, number one, they are all, almost all the planets are on the circular orbit around the sun, except Mercury. Mercury is slightly, you know, uh, it has the highest eccentricity. Then number two, what do you see here? Is the inner planets are rocks, solid. Outer planets are water, and maybe some carbon monoxide solid in Neptune and then you have Uranus. In between are what? These two most massive planets are gaseous. So these are the things we know, we understand, we think we, under, we, think, uh, we know it. And then we see these gaseous planets are in between. So where actually about four to five uh, AU, I mean at five AU is Jupiter. At that point kind of uh, there is this uh, water line or the line where water actually condenses so about 200 to 130 or 180 degree K. So these lines are these gaseous planets. So what we see is the eccentricity is very small. Planets are in the uh, distribution is in a way that we understand, we think that most of the solid planets are closer to a star, the rocky planets, the gaseous planet uh, or the liquid ones are further away, you know, out of the thing. So we can categorize this and we, can we go to the next slide please? So we can sum up the properties of the solar system that orbit angular momentum is close to the direct direction of sun's angular momentum that's in the plane. And three or, three or four terrestrial planets and three or four giant planets have obliquities. 
that is the angle between a spin and our vital angular momentum is less than 30 degree. Well, what we immediately come to your mind, I think, and this point is that interplanetary space is vastly empty, except for the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, and the Kupia belt, which is beyond, I think, Neptune. So planet account for about, and this is an important point and puzzling point, planet accounts for about 0.2% of mass of solar system. So most of the mass is in the sun. Even if I add all the mass of all the planet, it is only about 02 of the sun. But 98% of angular momentum is in the planets. So this is a very interesting point. It, it, it kind of points you toward the origin of uh, these planets. And then so solid planetary and satellite surface are heavily bombarded, cratered. So it must have been greater in first few billion years. And you know, sun is about five, four and a half billion years. And typically protoplanetary gas dis disappears in one to 10 million years. So outer planet must have, must have formed in less than this time. Why is that? Well, then you do not have matter, the matter was, I mean, the whole thing will disperse away much before that. So you have to have planet, otherwise there won't be any planet. Okay, so we have discarded this brown dwarf hypothesis. But imagine if, uh, I mean, as, you, I, as I told you, that brown dwarf is actually the deuterium burning. And the questions are brown, we saw brown dwarf desert, and minimum fragmentation mass for brown dwarf will be 10 Jupiter mass. Unfortunately, we don't have a uh, uh, that kind of fragmentation uh, regularity. And separate mechanism will be needed for different planet in uh, uh, solar system. And that is troublesome because you want to have one theory for everything. So come to the next one. Next slide, please. So uh, we have done with this, dealt with this. So can we go to the next one? So of course, the, the most attractive part is the nebular, hy nebular hypothesis. And what is that? I mean, many of you do the self-gravitating thing. So you say, all right, nebular hypothesis means following thing that there is a, can we go to the next slide, please? I mean, I will come back to this. So nebular hypothesis tells you that there is a dark cloud, molecular cloud, consisting of mostly molecule, H2 molecule, and this dense core somehow due to fluctuation it forms. And then there is this gravitational collapse and gravitational collapse causes the star to fall and also a disk around it because angular momentum of the falling matter must be preserved, conserved, therefore you will have a disk. And then there are bipolar, bipolar jets. And also in this protoplanetary planetary disk, we call it protoplanetary because in this, this planet forms, you will form, you will have the uh, planet to form around this uh, newborn star or protostar, you know. So this picture will something look like this. Can we go back to the previous slide, please? So this is the inertial in nuclear hypothesis. I mean, the uh, uh, nebular hypothesis. So questions are, how do you make terrestrial planet? Because all right, you had a self-gravitating gas cloud, but the disk may not be, disk may not be that uh, massive. So the self gravity may not be important in that, and that is reflected by two measures. Screen parameter. So instability is not sufficient. Q needs to be less than one. That means self gravity needs to dominate all other forces there, including rotation, pressure gradient, etc. In the disk, that is not respected. And second thing is that disk must cool sufficiently fast so that the condensation or fragmentation can take place. So neither of the condition is easy to satisfy. And therefore, planets may not form in the, at least the inner planets may not form due to self-gravity. So self-gravity is ruled out, it is unimportant. So maybe it could be important outside in the outer planet, massive planet outside the, in the outer disk, in the typical disk, which is of the size uh, of yeah. 100. Yeah. yeah, three minutes more. Three minutes more, all right. Yeah. So the planet formation, give me two more, we'll make it five. The planet can form by the dust condensation in the middle plane and this dust collide and colliding dust form planetesimal and planetesimal finally eat up each other and or scatter. 
and then what comes out is a planet which captures the remaining gas in the disk. So this is, can we go a couple of slides down? Okay, go down. So I have explained you go down. So this is the disk, real picture of disk, which has been HL tau, which has been actually uh, seen by these uh, people from NASA and elsewhere. So this picture is a star in the center and disk with the gaps there, gaps and rings. So this is the picture of your thing. Can we go down a couple of slides further? Because I don't have time now. Okay, so let us go there. Go, go back, go back. So I think I can explain you all the physics here. So what is happening is the planet must have migrated in the disk. How? By actually exchanging, injecting its angular momentum at the resonance points to the disk and disk acts back at the planet and cause it to migrate. So in this case, there is no wave excitation in between in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, below the inner and outer lin blood resonance. I mean, that is because uh, the, uh, the flow is subsonic here. So only way to do the planet to do the thing for the uh, disk is that disk acts back, the torque in the disk due to angular momentum injection causes the disk to migrate. And so the outer torque is more than the inner torque and therefore this differential causes the planet to go inward. So that is how hot you see in the next picture. Can we go to the next picture? So this is where it says you that actually here is a planet, it excites density waves and these density waves actually causes the a torque on the planet and this planet in the process migrates inward. And that, that's why you see the most massive planets perhaps are closer to the, in a tighter orbit uh, to their native star. The problem is, okay, can we go down? Further, two, two slides further, further down, further down, further down. I will skip this, go ahead, go ahead, go up, go up. So go up a little bit. So yeah, so the problem with the planet migration is it is too efficient. That means it, it is so fast that it, it will take the planet and it planet will fall in the star. So that means migration time is too short. And thus, that means we are missing some additional physics in the disk and that additional physics could be uh, entropic radiant or dust traps or magnetic field. So go back to the magnetic field. Go to the next slide, please. So here is a magnetic field. When the disk is kind of matter is accreting on a disk, uh, the, it drags the interstellar magnetic field in the disk. And therefore, you can't simply have the wave generated in a disk without the presence of the magnetic field. Thus, you require MHD equations to address this problem more correctly. So, can we go to the next slide, please? So what happens is the resonance point where this angular momentum by the planet is injected in the disk actually uh, moves further away from the planet and therefore the planet's uh, uh, torque on the planet weakens. Can we go to the next slide, please? Further down, further down. Go up, go up, go up, one slide, yeah. So what we see here, go, go up, yep, thank you. So what we see here is the hydrodynamic, the disk where magnetic field is absent. There you see the outer Lindblad resonance torque and the inner Lindblad resonance torque, which are solid line, tells you they are much more than when it is magnetized. So in the, in, in the presence of a weak magnetic field, even weak magnetic field, the outer and inner torque, lint blood uh, uh, resonance, and uh, consequently the torque is much weaker, much smaller than in the hydro case. Therefore, can we go to a straight to the conclusion summary part? Please go down. Go down. Please conclude. Yes. Yeah. So therefore, we can see that if we have in a disk we have magnetic field, torque decreases proportional to the magnetic field, and we can have migration dependent on the strength of the mass to flux ratio in any magnetized disk. Thus, the migration problem can be adequately addressed if we are dealing with the, uh, with the magnetized 
with the presence of the magnetic field in the disk. And that, that is the work we have done recently. And that's where I will end. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm done. Any question, please? Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Monday. So yes. uh, I will ask if there is any question for this. Anyone? Have, no one has written any question. So any, anyone is free to ask the question. If somebody yeah, wants to yeah, ask there is Pratiksha something. She is asking something. So uh, uh, Pratiksha, 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 you can come live and ask the question. Yeah, OK. Yeah, come on, quick. Good morning, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, please, please on your video also. OK. So, uh, sir, uh, I would like to, uh, like to ask you one thing. Uh, so, we know that uh, genes instability uh, is a mechanism by which we can explain planet formation. Uh, so, may I know that uh, if there is any length scale uh, within which this mechanism is applicable? Uh, about genes instability? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, basically, the gravitational instability. Actually, what you do there is that you, you will have a length scale which is dependent upon the uh, balance between the pressure gradient and self-gravity torque. So that will give you the length scale over which the, the, the disk will fragment, basically. But also you can actually change this by thinking that disk is differentially rotating. Therefore, you will have a effect of differential rotation that will modify that length scale a little bit. As a result, you can balance your self-gravity with the rotation, and that gives you a different scale. That scale may be slightly, if I remember, that scale will be slightly larger. Oh no, slightly larger. <coughs> okay, so yeah, yeah. But you can mm -hmm. see that. I mean, these scales are given, uh, you know, discussed in elaborately in many papers. Yeah. But you require to have that. Uh, Self gravity or genes, gravity, genes, uh, whatever, uh, operating only when self gravity of the disk is important. Most of the cases, self self gravity of the disk may not be so important. Actually, the magnetic field of the Lorentz charge will be important in MHD equations or the momentum equation than your self gravity charge. So that that is the point here. At least in this planet migration case, self gravity may not be so important. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Pandey, uh, for your uh, inspiring and elaborating this elaborate lecture, uh, invited talk. Thank you. And, and now I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Pintu Vandapadhyay. P. Vandapadhyay, are you here? Can you hear me? Uh, Dr. P. Vandapadhyay from IPR Gandhinagar. Hello. Uh, Professor Bose, uh, yes. he's, he's there. He's there. He's right. Is he here? Yeah, yeah. Your audio is not coming. That you do. Hmm? Dr. Pintu, your audio is not coming. Uh, Dr. Pintu, if you have some problems, so we can ask to other speaker, next speaker. Yeah. And later yeah, we can present. Nice. So please resolve your problem first. So, sir, you can call uh, next speaker. Later we will. So shall, shall we call uh, Dr. Mishra? Yeah, for yeah, his talk? yeah, you can call. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Are you. Uh, Dr. Mishra, Dr. A.P. Mishra from Vishwasri University, Shantini Ketan. Are you here? Yeah, I am here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Your uh, uh, today's topic right. is for invited talk. It is Landau damping due to multiplasma resonances in a degenerated plasma, a new non local KDV equation. Okay. Thank you very much. You can start okay. now. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Uh, there is a problem. Just a minute. Below you will find new. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, now it's okay. So can you can you see the my slides? Yes, yes you can see. You can okay. See. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and especially Ram Prasad Prajapati for taking such an initiative to organize a wonderful e-conference. Uh, and also for inviting me uh, to this event uh, to deliver some of my uh, research works, uh, which I have uh, done along with my collaborators uh, in the context of uh, Landau damping. So the title is Landau damping uh, due to multiplasma resonances uh, in a degenerate plasma. Uh, also. Uh, I would like to show how the multiplasma resonances uh, along with the phase velocity resonance that we know uh, gives rise some kind of uh, non-local KDB equation and hence uh, the profile of the solitary waves and also Landau damping due to multiplasma resonances. So the outline is I would like to first uh, speak on some uh, basic concept of Landau damping uh, which we know and also how the Landau damping uh, starting from classical to quantum regime takes place and how the multiplasma resonance involves in the quantum regime and uh, what is the physical meaning of the multiplasma resonance and how it contributes uh, uh, to the wave damping of especially solitary waves and uh, then we go ahead to the nonlinearism of Landau damping of uh, low frequency electron acoustic waves, uh, which uh, can be supported by two temperature electron plasma or, uh, or any other component just like uh, uh, two ion plasmas. And then we conclude uh, uh, some of our uh, results. So motivation is uh, the Landau damping is one of the most important fundamental phenomena that we know in the context of plasma physics as well as some other nonlinear mediums, uh, especially uh, material nanosciences, nanoparticles, uh, metamaterials, and also plasmonic devices. So it not only occurs for plasmas, but it can also be excited due to the phonon and the photon oscillations. And uh, that we know that uh, it, it is very much useful for the particle accelerations due to the energy exchange between the waves and particles. So uh, it can be controlled uh, for the stability of charged particle beams uh, in the particle accelerator schemes. So as in plasmonic devices uh, in metal nanostructures, so it can provide the dominant dissipative mechanism for the broadening of surface plasma. So that is a huge challenge for the plasmonic devices and in plasmonic technology. Uh, furthermore, it can be um, manipulated also. The so people are solving uh, and now ramping the full blast of poison system numerically, uh, such as uh, PIC simulation as well. As well. And uh, one important thing is that when we investigate, when we go beyond from the classical, semi-classical to the quantum regimes, so one has the freedom uh, to have a transition from classical to quantum and vice versa. Uh, because uh, it has been experimentally established using metallic nanoparticles that uh, there may be some classical quantum transition of plasmas. So those are the basically basis for the motivation of uh, uh, studying uh, some kind of uh, Landau damping, especially in the nonlinear regimes. So history says that uh, 
Landau damping was first discovered by uh, Lev Landau uh, in 1946, uh, which was uh, while he was solving uh, the blossom poison system mathematically and later established physically also. And uh, it was basically the decay of plasma oscillations, the plasma oscillations, what we call the Langmuir oscillations. And in 1949, also uh, Bohm and Gross, uh, they pointed out that land of damping is due to the energy transfer between the waves and the particles. So that uh, there are uh, some coherent waves and which are propagating and the particles follow the waves, they exchange the energy. Uh, so that uh, in gaining the energy uh, by the particles, the waves can be damped. So in other sense, in 1955, the Van uh, Katman, they also proved by fully analyzing the blast of Poisson equations. And uh, they showed that the blast of Poisson equations have a continuous wave spectra, uh, uh, having the singularities of the normal modes. However, the two decades later, uh, it was proved uh, experimentally that Landau ramping is really a, a fact and which can be verified experimentally. And it was done by Nelmark and uh, Horton in 1964. So now what is the physical mechanism uh, of the Landau ramping? So if you just uh, go to, uh, if we have a, a say Maxwellian distribution and the distribution functions looks like this and you have a, a slow, positive slope on the left hand side and on the other hand, on the right hand side, you have a negative slope. So that means if you have a slower particles uh, which are large in number than the faster particles. So that means if the number of slower particles having the velocity lower than the phase velocity is much higher than the faster particles having velocity higher than the phase velocity of the wave. So you can expect there is an energy exchange uh, of the particles uh, and the waves so that waves can be damped. So that in order to be accelerated, uh, in order to have accelerations of the particles, so particles must have some slower speed uh, than the phase velocity of the wave. So this uh, physical mechanism is similar uh, when a surfer moves uh, uh, in the uh, open sea also. And if we consider the particle as a surfer and the wave uh, in the water, wave, for example, then whenever the surfer has the, phase it has the velocity, which is higher than the uh, velocity, phase velocity of the wave, then the particle uh, and the surfer will lose energy. And whenever it goes uphill, so it will again gain energy and whenever it has the velocity uh, slower than the velocity of the wind. So this is uh, the basically the physical mechanism of the Landau damping that is also known in the literature and that we all know. So now what we know in the classical regimes, basically whenever we have the blast of Poisson system, so then one obtains by Fourier, uh, by perturbing the physical quantities, the distribution and the electrostatic potential into its equilibrium and perturbation parts. So then one obtains the dispersion relations. So which we see that omega by k, there's the phase velocity is the resonance velocity. So now going beyond the classical regimes. So because uh, as a classical mathematical counterpart of the quantum mechanics, so Wigner uh, equation is uh, uh, which allows the transition, the generalization from quantum to classical. So that means whenever we have a Wigner allocation like this, and if we expand in the weak quantum region, so then we can recover some kind of semi-classical blast of equations. So together with some dispersive term, so which uh, basically uh, contributes to the particle dispersion and in the weak quantum region. So now if we solve this weak equations similar to the blast of Poisson system, so then one obtains in the linear, linearization this dispersion relation, where F0 is the particle distribution function. So now, as in the numerator, you see, though the dispersion relation gets modified due to the quantum corrections in the semi-classical limit, so still you have the Phase, phase velocity as the resonance velocity. So that means 
starting from the classical to semi classical the resonance speed has not been yet modified though the dispersion relation has some counterpart uh, due to the quantum corrections in the weak quantum region so now if we consider the strong quantum resonance whenever uh, the particles whenever the wavelength the scale size is comparable to the de broglie wavelength so then we have to deal with the wigner myelin poisson system so one is, what what is known is that this wigner myel uh, only includes the particle dispersion not the exchange correlation and the spin of the particles so that means what happens if we just linearize this system simply and one obtains the dispersion relation so you see the denominator which contributes the pole has significantly been modified when one obtains uh, the resonance velocity which is being shifted by the quantum velocity h bar k by 2m and this is basically omega by k equal to h, k, h bar k by 2m is nothing but the dispersion relations if one can solve the uh, one particle schrodinger equations and uh, if the field goes to zero so then then one obtains omega by k is basically h bar k by 2m so that will be clear in the next uh, few slides so just to point out that if one goes beyond the classical to semi classical to the quantum resonance so the resonance of the particles and the resonance not only the phase velocity but it is shifted uh, by the quantum velocity that is h bar k by 2m so now naturally uh, what is the physical meaning of the plasmon resonance if we just see in the linear theory that one can see basically one plasmon resonance can be identified but what is then the one plasmon resonance as we see in the classical and quantum resonance the resonance particles still have the velocity close to the phase velocity of the wave so that is uh, known to us okay if one goes beyond the classical semi classical to the quantum resonance that we obtain the plasmon resonance that is the resonance conditions fulfills this conditions omega minus k b plus minus etc so that means uh, together with the minus sign as well as the plus sign can contribute to the resonance with the wave and what happens is that if a particle simply if we just understand uh, the physical meaning of plasmon resonance if a particle absorbs or emits the wave quanta so then before absorption is h bar k1 just similar to the photon and it can gain the momentum it, the momentum can be increased or decreased due to the plus sign and minus sign and this is the after absorption or emission so that means h bar k is similar to the photon wavelength and <clears throat> and this is the momentum relation and for one plasmon quantum and similarly we have the uh, change of the energy due to this h bar omega 1 plus minus h bar omega equal to h bar omega 2 so omega 1 and omega 2 are the frequencies uh, which can satisfy this dispersion relation and this can be obtained from the one particle schrodinger equation in the linearization so that means whenever the field goes to the potential field goes to zero so we can obtain the omega as simply h bar k square by 2m and simply omega by k is h bar k by 2m and that is the basis how the uh, the particle velocity in the quantum resonance uh, has been uh, shifted to the um, omega by omega by uh, by h bar k by 2m so this results uh, in the quantum modification of the resonance velocity as we have seen in this dispersion relation here so naturally whenever we go beyond the linear resonance so one thing uh, it requires the simultaneous absorption of the multiple wave quanta instead of single wave quanta at a time so that means we have to generalize the resonance conditions so that means whenever you insert in here also then uh, n equal to 1 to 3 so n equal to 1 corresponds to one plasmon resonance 2 equal to 2 plasmon resonance and 3 equal to 3 plasmon resonance so naturally the question is that whenever the one plasmon two plasmon and three plasmon resonance can appear 
So in fact, what we have seen that in the linear theory, only one plasmon resonance can take place. So however, if we go beyond the linear theory, that means simply if we uh, investigate, say, the uh, for the propagation of wave envelopes uh, through the nonlinear Schrodinger equations. So then one have to obtain the nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, in the QB order of the nonlinearities. So that means you can expect up to the three plasmon resonance. Similarly, for the KDB equation, KDB descriptions, so one needs the second order perturbations. So that means one expects the one and two plasmon resonance. So thus, up to this, we conclude that the multi plasmon resonance velocity is nothing but omega by k plus minus n h bar k by 2m. So that is the phase velocity is shifted by this one. And uh, in fact, the resonance velocity can have the plus sign and the minus sign. So of course, because lower plasma velocity particle achieve uh, for the resonance more quickly than the plus sign. So that means the resonance occurs due to the minus sign of the uh, velocities. So next, uh, uh, we, but we, whenever we apply this uh, multi plasma resonances in the nonlinear theory of propagation of, say, for example, solitary waves. So, then uh, what are known in the literature that the two and three plasma processes uh, can take place in the modulation of a wave envelope, that means uh, of uh, high frequency Langmuir waves, through the descriptions of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. However, for short wavelengths, that means for the uh, Langmuir wave oscillations, the one plasma resonance uh, can be outside the Fermi sphere. Because whenever we consider the equilibrium distribution of particles as due to the Fermi Dirac distributions, so there are some velocities uh, which are uh, greater than the Fermi velocities, and also there are some particles, no particles will be. Uh, sorry, less than the Fermi velocity and no particles beyond the Fermi velocity. So that means uh, for sort of blank waves for Langmuir waves, for example, so only two and three plasma processes can contribute to the wave damping mechanism along with the group velocity of the wave envelopes. However, for long wavelength regimes, for example, if we consider the low frequency waves, for example, ion acoustic wave or electron acoustic wave, for example, so then the one plasma resonance may be, one plasma resonance velocity may not be the outside the Fermi sphere. So that means, uh, in addition to the phase velocity, one plasma resonance, so there may be a contribution from the two plasma resonance to the wave damping processes. So uh, our aim is here to consider the multi plasma resonance to the nonlinear theory of electron acoustic waves, which is entirely unknown and still unknown in the literature. So, now the basis for consideration of two electron temperature is that so electrons can be divided into two groups in the non equilibrium plasmas because uh, this can occur uh, because uh, some electrons can be heated by means of uh, some external sources, the waves and beams. And also, before the steady state equilibrium takes place, so the electrons will have enough time to remain in the two groups, that is two temperature electrons. So now the two temperature electrons can be found naturally as, for example, the various quasi parallel force of regions in many experiments because people are trying to observe in experiments and also in space and astrophysical regions, for example, in the solar corona, the planetary atmosphere, the neutron star and magnetospheres. So you can observe uh, the two electron temperature plasma waves. So in most of the cases as the solitary waves. The important is that the two temperature plasmas, two electron temperature plasmas support the low frequency electron acoustic waves. So in the classical theory that is known, and also, the importance is that the electron acoustic waves can play a vital role 
in the interpretation of broadband electrostatic noise. In most of the cases, those noise are due to the dynamics of the electrons and not the ions. And those noise are associated with the solitary pulses. So now before going to investigate the nonlinear layout damping due to multiplasma resonances of electron acoustic waves in two electron temperature plasmas. So we have some kind of assumptions in the sense that we consider fully degenerate plasma. So no, no finite temperature plasma. So that equilibrium distribution is due to the Fermi Dirac distribution function. The second one, <clears throat> the hot electron species are highly dense compared to the cold electron species. species. So naturally, hot electrons will provide the inertial force, uh, sorry, uh, the restoring force, while the cold electrons will provide the inertial force. And of course, uh, we dynamics of the ions uh, because of their heavy inertia. So ions can form only the neutralizing background. Uh, Professor Mishra, and the last one is three minutes more. Sorry, you have three minutes more. Oh, okay. okay. And also for low frequency waves, so we can have the multiple ion resonances. So only due to the hot electrons because the phase velocity have some kind of restrictions. So now this is the, as you said, this is the Wigner Poisson model and the distribution function into the Fermi Dirac. So there are particles, uh, no particles, uh, which is the velocity much higher than the Fermi velocity. So that means only hot electrons will contribute to the wave damping mechanism. So now if we just uh, use the mul multiple scale perturbation technique, that means uh, we, we put up the distribution function as well as the electrostatic potential. So a lot of uh, perturbations and stretch coordinates has to be modified from the usual KDB equations. So this is the modification of the stretch coordinates. And also we express the part of quantities uh, due to the Fourier Laplace transform. So he's propagated as uh, waves having the phase velocity along the giant direction. So in the first order approximation, we have the linear dispersion relations. And because the linear uh, plasmon is known in the literature, uh, this contour uh, only con uh, does not contribute the poles. So what involves is that whenever we go beyond the linear perturbation to the second order perturbation, so, so you have a lot of singularities in the integrations. So that means this is the uh, significance and signatures of the how the two and three plasmon resonances contribute to the wave dynamics. So uh, after a few uh, algebras, so we arrive at this uh, KTB equations, so which have uh, the non-local non-linear term. So basically, A, B, R, gamma are complex due to the complex nature of the alpha. And this occurs basically the singularities and due to the resonances at uh, not only the phase velocities, but due to the one and two plasma resonances. So now one important thing is that how to uh, consider the important plasma resonance uh, so that if we just plot the phase velocity in the weak quantum and the strong quantum resonance. So that means some velocities uh, along with the phase velocities have uh, beyond the Fermi velocity and also the lower the Fermi velocity. So those particles uh, which is the velocity is lower than the Fermi velocity. So are to be included in the uh, uh, important resonance. So similarly, we can have the resumes for the weak quantum case. So now how do you classify the uh, strong quantum and the weak quantum regimes. So most in important and interesting regime is that. So whenever you restrict the conditions to some regimes, so then all the plasma velocities can satisfy it and below the Fermi velocities. So similarly in the weak quantum regimes, so one has the freedom that, so the resonance velocity one and two plasma as well as the phase velocity, all are below the Fermi velocity in the entire regime of K less than one. So the most important is that whether this non-local KDB equation satisfies the conservation's law. So in fact, it satisfies the particle conservation. So simply, if we uh, look at the energy conservation, so that means you see that uh, the rate of change of energy, wave energy, plus the positive definitely integral equal to zero. So that means the rate of change of wave energy 
uh, decreases due to the negative sign. So that means it is a signal, and this R is basically due to the plasma resonance wave damping. So that means it is the signature to the fact that the new finite wave solution can exist. So that means wave energy decays as time progresses due to the Landau damping. So now if one uh, look at the solution of the solitary wave uh, of the non-local KDB equation, so in fact it is known that whenever there is no damping, so you have the sig hyperbolic profile. So however, this uh, has to be modified in the multiple scale technique. So then one obtains uh, the KDB equation with uh, amplitude which decays with time. And the most important is that this decay rate is quite distinctive from the um, obtained by Watt and Sudan in 1969 for classical plasmas. So now so let us now conclude. conclude. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'm coming to the conclusion. So what we have observed is that we have two different regimes. One is the strong quantum and as well as the weak quantum regimes for which the plasma resonance can be important along with the phase velocity resonance. So in contrast to the classical and semi-classical plasma, the phase velocity not only plays the damping mechanism, rather the two plasma and one plasma processes are dominant for the wave damping of nonlinear electron acoustic waves. Uh, not only the multiplasma resonances give rise uh, some non-local term, and also the, the coefficients of the KDB equation become complex due to these uh, multiplasma resonances. And most important is that the damping rate is not the, uh, which was obtained by Watt and Sudan in, 1969, uh, in 1969, but the damping rate is quite slower than the uh, predicted in the classical system. So uh, finally, some remarks is that the work is still underway. So some results and conclusions are uh, maybe modified also. And the present approach may be generalized to some cases. Uh, for example, if we consider the particle distributions which have finite temperature degeneracy, that most, most difficult to handle with the mathematical formulations. And also some numerical simulation of the entire KDB, non-local KDB equations for the evolution of electron acoustic wave. So those are the references uh, which we have considered for the uh, study of electron acoustic, especially the nonlinear Landau damping uh, due to multiplasma resonances in two, two electron temperature plasmas. And finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank my collaborators, Gerd Brodin of Umeå University and uh, Dilshani Chatterjee, and also funding agency uh, science and engineering research board for a major research project and uh, thank you all okay thank you very much professor mishra uh, is there any question from the audience yeah yeah there is yeah should we there are two questions with... uh, yes yes yeah i have a small question yeah sure yeah Mishra, thank you for thank you for a very nice talk. Yeah, but small question is for the youngster also. Uh, can we apply the same model to ion crystal waves? Uh, not at all. Uh, the problem is that uh, how to treat the ions classically with the blast off system. That will be also difficult because, in one sense, electrons are uh, degenerate. In the other way, uh, the ions are also classical. So we have to deal with the Wigner model. Uh, Moyle, uh, as well as the blast of system. So that may be difficult to handle with, especially the mathematical formality. Okay. So, thank you. And the second question? Yes. Please spell out. Yeah. 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 Uh, there, are, there are two questions in the chat box. Deep Kumar Kori. Yes. Deep Kumar Kori is there? Yes, sir. I am here. Sir. Okay. Please on your video and you can ask the question. Yes, sir. Just a minute, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, thank you for such a nice talk. I just wish to ask you that. Uh, I mean, uh, the resonance criteria which you have shown that omega minus kV minus h plus square 
eight by four yeah. divided by yeah. So what could be the possible values for the wavelength so that that particular res resonance criteria gets satisfied in the quantum regime? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. Actually, we have some uh, uh, considered some quantum regime. So that means uh, whenever just to go back to the slide, maybe. Uh, whenever you say the quantum regime, so you have the wavelength is of the order of the de Broglie wavelength. Yeah. And in the second one, whenever you have a parameter regime, uh, which I have shown in the graphs, this one. So here, here you have the K lambda is the wavelength. And for uh, low frequency waves, so the wavelength must be smaller than the unity. Okay. So that is why for the weak and strong quantum regimes, we have classified the regimes, which we have uh, interpreted as the most interesting regime. So this is the regime in which the plasma resonance, the lower plasma resonance, which quickly contribute to the wave damping than the plus sign is most important here also in this regime. And similarly for the weak quantum regime, we have this entire uh, zero less than K lambda H less than one, uh, whenever in this regime, this uh, uh, plasma resonance could be important. Is it clear to you? Yeah, I about the density which we are choosing, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, density, of course, uh, in the strong quantum resonance, you have this, or oh, might be, oh, sorry, this may be 22. No and this be, so I am yeah. sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is copy and paste error, maybe. <laughs> So this should be the higher density than this one, of course. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Mishra. I think nobody has any question right now. We are very much thankful to you for a good and very um, exciting lecture. And now I will call uh, Professor uh, Dr. P. Bandapadhai. I'm here. Can you hear now? Yes. Now Dr. Dr. Mishra, you. please close your, please stop your screen share. Uh, yeah. Can you screen share with us? Yeah, it's okay now. Is visible? Yes, oh, clearly yes. visible. Yes, now it is visible. Thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we have invited talk from Dr. P. Bandhavadhar, Pintu Bandhavadhar, from IPR Gandhinagar. And his talk is based on experiments in DC Coulomb crystals. Professor Bandhavadhar, please carry on. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer who has given me a chance to present my work in this platform and especially thanks to Dr. Prujavati. So actually I'm from uh, Institute for Plasma Research and doing research in experimental plasma, experimental plasma physics. So today I will talk about the experiments on DC Coulomb crystal and uh, collaborators are uh, the the students mostly it is Hari Prasad Sarabanan and Garima and Professor Avijit Sen. So so I'll talk I'll start with very brief introduction of dusty plasma and why we need to study dusty plasmas. Then I'll talk about uh, the experimental challenges that are earlier found by the other researchers to form a DC Coulomb crystals. And then I'll talk about the experimental setup and discharge and plasma parameters. And then I'll talk about few experiments that we have already carried out, mostly in the formation of DC Coulomb crystal and its characterization, crystal cracking, cluster formation, phase transition, and finally I will conclude. So dusty plasma is nothing but a conventional two component plasma. In addition, small particles of solid matter in the range of nanoparticle, nano size to micro size particle. 
And as this plasma, the mixture of plasma along with the small particles makes the system more complex, we call sometimes as a complex plasma. So when you put the particle in the plasma, the mostly the dielectric particle in the plasma, they gets they absorb electrons and ions, and as the mobility of electrons is higher than the ions, those dust particles get negatively charged. And they found an appropriate electric field where they can levitate. And so their dynamics like electrons and ions. So this system is very interesting system. Uh, sometimes it is uh, it behaves like a colloidal system where the dust component can be uh, showing some interesting uh, phenomena like phase transition, phase coexistence, and all. Sometimes the liquid behavior also. Interestingly, this dust particles is very massive and highly charged, and hence the time scale is much faster than the colloids, but slower than the plasma time scale, uh, for example, electron time scale and ion time scale. So dusty plasma can be used to study the different branches of physics to study the basic to, to un understand the basic phenomena, including the fluid mechanics, classical mechanics, solid state physics, colloidal plasma, thermodynamics, and many more. Dusty plasma, uh, as Professor Pandey uh, discussed in the morning, uh, can be used to understand different uh, astrophysical and solar uh, phenomena, including the dust tail in a uh, in a comet, Saturn's ring, moon's cloud, along with the, uh, the dust particle in tokamak plasmas plays a very negative role. Because the presence of dust particle, it absorbs electrons and ions from the plasma and it degrades the quality of the plasma. And because uh, inside the plasma, there are some radiation loss because of the electrons, because of the, the presence of dust particles. And dust particles contaminate the, the plasma uh, inside a tokamak. And sometimes the researchers who are working in tokamak plasma, they found difficulties to density control because of the presence of dust particles. And dusty plasma has a positive as well as negative role in industrial applications. Particle contaminates on silicon wafer, which is very bad for the, uh, the those uh, uh, applications. A large application in nanotechnology, which can be used as a positive part of dusty plasma, cleaning of electronic circuit that can also be done using a dusty plasma. So why it is very difficult to create a DC uh, Coulomb crystal? Basically, Coulomb crystal is nothing but the ordered structures of those micron or some micron particles in a plasma. So when normally the dusty, the crystalline structures, they're studied in a RF plasmas. Why it is in RF plasmas? Because in RF plasma, there is not much steaming ions that can disturb the formation of crystalline structures. As the ions cannot follow the frequency of the RF signal that is of 13.56 megahertz. And as a result, the ions, they stay stationary and could not respond to the electric, first electric field. When you come to the DC electric, DC plasma, you have a DC electric fields in between anode and cathode. And the, the ions which are generated from the anode, they accelerate towards the cathode and they put their energy or they deposit their energy to the dust particles. And hence it is very difficult to study the dusty plasma crystalline structure mainly in a DC plasma system. So to address this point, we have built a new setup at IPR.
which can minimize the ion steaming and to form a crystalline structures. So we have built a small experimental setup that is basically a tabletop setup to study uh, the uh, dusty plasma crystalline structures. And what we did, we have used a PICEPT experimental chamber in which we made a uh, asymmetry in the electrode configuration. The, we use a uh, circular uh, cathode, uh, anode, sorry, and a long tail cathode. And the dust particles forms in the middle, mostly in the middle of the cathode, where we can avoid the direct ion streaming. So before, uh, so uh, this is the experimental chamber. It has many radial and axial ports. They are used either for pumping the gas introduction or uh, for diagnostics, different diagnostics, and uh, to dispense the particle inside the plasma and for many other reasons. To start off, we, uh, we pump down the chamber using a rotary pump and then we introduce the argon gas and then we discharge the plasma by applying a DC voltage in between anode and cathode. And to ensure whether we have minimized the uh, ion streaming, we have exposed the cathode for eight hours around to see what happens through the cathode. And after taking out the cathode, we have found there is a very dark spot around a circular ring that we placed on the cathode. And the, this, the circular ring that shows, that is the uh, place where we put the circular ring. Of course, there will not be any ion steaming because of the circular ring, but you can see a clear dark spot around this ring, which is because of the strong sputtering arising, arising from the impact of energetic ions are seen as a dark burnt areas. But interestingly, you cannot see any of those dark spots in the region C, where we have done our experiment. So it ensures, this experiment ensures that we are really successful to minimize the ion steaming. Then what we did, then we put the dust particle, introduce the dust particle into this uh, plasma by a dust dispenser. So this uh, figure shows the axial and uh, radial view of the plasma. And the background pressure was around 5 to 15 Pascal. The discharge voltage was 280 to 500 volt. Electron temperature that was around 2 to 5 electron volt that was measured by uh, the Langmuir probe. And the plasma density that is 5 into 14 to 1 into 15 per meter cube. And that is a typical DC Coulomb cluster or crystal that we have obtained in our experiment. So now as we produce the plasma, we have ensured that the ion steaming is now minimized and we form a crystalline structure. Now let us characterize those crystalline structures. So this is a typical image of uh, uh, particles which forms a crystalline structures. And we then uh, make a, uh, the track individual particle, particle coordinates for a longer time, for example, few seconds. And from the information of the particle coordinates, we estimate the pair correlation function. That is the probability between the particles, probability of finding the particles between R and R plus DR and which gives the interparticle distance and the periodic peaks in the uh, pair correlation function that essentially gives the structures are well arranged and they're indeed ordered structures. And the, this is a Voronoi diagram and this is a triangular, uh, the Delonoi triangulation techniques to characterize the dusty plasma and both the techniques shows the dusty plasma has a hexagonal structures with a triangular symmetry. And the coordination number is found to be six. That is the particle around each reference particle. Then we calculate 
the dust uh, temperature as well as the uh, coupling parameter which is the ratio of electrostatic for electrostatic energy by the thermal energy how we did as i told in my earlier slide that we have uh, uh, tracked individual particles for over the time and from the coordinates of the particle we can study the Langevin dynamics which is a function of that is a basically probability of finding particles having uh, coordinate r and velocity v so it has two components one gives directly the temperature and another component gives the the coupling parameter the displacement distribution function gives the uh, coupling parameter and the the velocity display velocity distribution function that gives the temperature so from the data what we have obtained from our experiment we found the dust temperature varies from 0.1 ev to 1 ev for some experiment and coupling parameter varies from uh, 20 to 1000 so the the dusty plasma what we uh, found uh, in our experiment that is not basically a very homogeneous dusty plasma it has a uh, uh, variation the radial variation of uh, separation of between the particles the temperature variation and the coulomb coupling parameter variation in the center the temperature is maximum the interparticle distance is minimum and as the coulomb coupling parameter depends upon the separation um, between the particles and the temperature so the coulomb coupling parameter is found to be minimum in the center and maximum in the edges although we didn't calculate the gamma from the information of separation uh, the interparticle distance and the temperature we have directly uh, estimated the coulomb coupling parameter from the langevin dynamics so how those parameters depend on the 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 pressure background pressure so when you increase the pressure so neutral normally acts as a energy absorber from the dust particles and hence the temperature of the dust particle decreases because of uh, frequent collisions with the neutrals and the separation of the uh, separation between the particle that increases when why it is increases because when you increase the pressure the ionization will be more the, the density of plasma will be more as a result the device length will be less and as a result the sheet thickness around the confining ring will be small and the particle will be spread it out and the, as a result the interparticle distance will be increased and as i told the the gamma also shows a variation which is maximum uh, for a particular pressure at 9.5 pascal and for both the edges the coulomb coupling parameter decreases because of the variation of temperature and the the interparticle distance however the structural order parameter this, this order parameter basically the ratio between the hexagonal structure divided by the total structure in the Voronoi diagram that ratio gives the the the, uh, the structure parameter that is that remains almost the same and it is almost 90 percent of the crystal that remains in a hexagonal structures and that doesn't change with the background pressure now let us see some results that we did uh, we perform an experiment on the crystal cracking what we did in this experiment we put one bigger particle in the coulomb um, in, in this crystalline structure this in, encircled particle if you see the size of the particle is little bit bigger and hence it levitated below beneath this crystalline structures when you in, in include this uh, particle in the uh, bottom layer this particle start to interact with the whole crystalline structures so this the schematic diagram shows how this uh, bigger particles interact with this the crystal and the particles which resides in the crystalline structures and this is the overlap of particle position 
and the blue dots blue blue circle blue dots that is the initial position of the frames and the the red dots that is the final position and you see the in the near the location of the particle the uh, the crystalline shows a uh, i mean defects or uh, line defects or uh, some kind of disorder otherwise the 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 outer plane outer layer of the crystalline structure it remains as it is now we purposefully energize the the bigger particle the test particle by a laser beam we saw with the increase of the laser power the particle shows uh, and the make the the crystalline structure even more random the disorder increases let us see how the inter uh, the 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 particle the test particle disturbs the whole crystals again we analyze our data just before uh, the energizing the particle and after after the energizing the particle we see there are some uh, the line defects very few line defects and the small uh, point defects when the particles on the bigger particles the test particle is not energized but when we energize uh, by the laser we found this whole crystal is showing disorderness and as a result you will see many dislocations or dislocation in the crystalline structures so then we again calculate the order parameter that i have already defined that is the total number of hexagonal cells in the boronoi diagram to the total number of cells and it founds that this number uh, fluctuates around 80 when the the crystal is not as such cracked by the test particles but when the the, the particle is energized with the laser we found this fluctuation is even becoming random and there are some instantaneous uh, average of the uh, the order parameter other than a uh, lower fluctuation slower average value of the the order parameter so this essentially means that the test particle which is energized by the uh, the energy of the laser that really disturbed the whole crystalline structures or that really cracked the whole crystalline order state so now what we did we we did some experiment that we forcefully push a particle from outside the crystalline structure to the the crystalline structures and then we take take out the particle from the crystalline structures and we found how the order how the uh, the defects that line defects that propagates we see the line defects they randomly move here and there there is no direct any trend but this uh, particles they really uh, um, uh, disturbs the whole crystalline structures with a lower order parameters and in the next analysis what we did we analyze how the temperature of the average temperature of the crystalline structure that changes with the time so these two first two points they are the uh, the temperature of the particles the dust particles inside the crystalline structure when they are not the test particles are not introduced near the crystalline structures when they introduce in the crystalline structure we found the dust temperature increases and when these um, particles they come out from the the crystalline structure they then the uh, the temperature reduces and finally it comes to the original temperature when the dust the test particles were not there in the near the crystalline structures and bandhapada you have 3 minutes more sorry Three minutes more. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let yeah. me pass it. Yeah. So uh, then we um, uh, measure the angle between two crystalline lines, two crystal lines that we found uh, when the crystal, uh, the test particle didn't enter into the crystal, and when it uh, when it left the crystal, and we found this angle remains almost same. That essentially 
illustrated that the microscopically exhibits the response to any kind of external perturbation and hence exhibit strong viscoelastic nature of the uh, the system now we did a uh, ex experiment on the formation of, of the coulomb cluster and we found we initially uh, did the experiment with very few particles and we started to add the particle into the main system and we found this whole the system of the particles along with the individual particles they are repelled by the newly added particles and this is with the number of particles how they are they, they, they are interacting with the um, uh, original number of the particles and to characterize this kind of plasma, uh, dusty plasma or crystals, we um, measure the orientation order parameter that is defined by psi 6 and we found uh, the, this psi 6, the, uh, the blue dot essentially tells that psi 6 is more than 80% and the red is less than uh, the, the blue dot is more than 60% and the red dots are less than 60%. So that essentially tells the particles, uh, the, the, the whole crystalline structures, they, they shows different dynamics with the number of dust particles, including the separation of the particles, temperature of the particles, Coulomb coupling parameter, and the, uh, the thermodynamics of the whole system. That depends upon how many particles you are adding to the main crystalline structures, cluster. And this is the, uh, the typical images, how uh, the system goes from a excited state to the ground state. The ground state, basically a state that depends upon the background plasma parameter. It never changes as long as you didn't change the plasma parameters. And this is defined kind of excited state that we have found that changes with the number of particles. So in the next, experiment, we did a very unique experiment that is the first order phase transition. Uh, phase transition has already been done in dusty plasma, but they reported they are mostly in the second order phase transition. But here, as we have uh, control under ion steaming, we can make the ion steaming more stronger and make the dust particles to melt in a, uh, by changing the, uh, the discharge parameter with a small value. So these first three figures are the overlap of the coordinate of the particles, the pair collision function and the Voronoi diagram. The, they are showing a very nice crystalline structure, although there are some points or line defects, but, but when they melt, this uh, melts by changing the sudden change of uh, the, um, the background pressure and they are very random. There is no periodic uh, periodicity in the pair correlation function and as a result, the Voronoi diagram becomes very disordered. So what happened? Why this uh, phase transition happens? It happens, suppose you have a crystalline structures and because of the ion streaming, each particle in the crystalline structure forms a OX in the, in the beneath. The OX happens, the formation OX, OX, formation of OX that forms because of the ion focusing because of the negatively charged particle. And if you can compress the crystalline structure and put some particle beneath to the main crystalline structure. The, uh, the particle in this, uh, the beneath particle start interacting with the OX as well as this uh, particle start interacting with the main, the main crystalline structures. So when this, uh, the imbalance of these two forces, one is attractive force, one is repulsive force. If you can generate an imbalance, strong imbalance, then the whole crystalline structure melts. And we, why we are calling it as a first order phase transition? Because if you see the, uh, the parameters, the gamma, temperature, and the structure factor, they changes suddenly by changing uh, pressure from 6.3 Pascal to uh, 6.3135 Pascal. So in the small change of pressure, we found the uh, Coulomb coupling parameter, the temperature, and the order parameter, they simply uh, jump from a value uh, few order more. And we ensure this by performing another set of experiment that, that is the hysteresis of the Coulomb coupling parameter. This experiment also ensured that this 
the transition is indeed a first order transition. And to uh, uh, know why it is happening, we take a uh, snapshot of the particles uh, in the perpendicular direction, where we found the particles from a chain uh, ch uh, ch in a one dimension crystalline structures. And if you um, melt it by change of uh, small change of pressure, this uh, the order structure becomes very violent. Dr. So, please conclude. So I'm done, I'm done. So this is the power spectrum, that is uh, the power spectrum of those, those particles before the crystalline and after the crystalline state. And we found that when the crystal melts, it shows a, uh, the one mode in the system. And this is the in-plane fluctuation, which is around 22 hertz, which is very far from 30 hertz. So it essentially says the ion focus induced wakes, that is the responsible to create a uh, first order or to uh, make a first order phase transition in our crystalline phase. So to conclude, we have uh, built up a new tabletop experimental device at IPR to study the DC Coulomb crystal. The combination of asymmetrical electrode configuration in presence of circular confining ring plays an important role in facilitating the creation of uh, Coulomb crystal in a DC glow discharge plasma. The crystalline nature of the structure is confined to a host of characterizing parameters like uh, pair correlation function, Voronoi diagram, Delonoi triangulation, the order parameter, dust temperature, Coulomb coupling parameter, etc. Et the various kinds of experiment has already been performed, which includes the formation of Coulomb cluster, first order phase transitions, uh, the formation of uh, Coulomb crystal, uh, crystal cracking, and etc. Our experimental, we believe that our experimental results could be useful to understand the wider set of uh, two dimensional crystalline systems. And finally, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bandhapadha. Is there any question around? Hello. There, oh, are, two, there are two, three questions in the chat box. One okay. asked by Ankita, Ankit Dhaka, does the change of pressure exist? Does the change of pressure also change the charge of dust particle? Yes, uh, we have indeed, uh, I mean, it, it really changes the charge of particle as long as uh, the plasma parameter, they changes. So, uh, yes, I, I agree. The charge really changes with the change of the uh, the uh, the discharge parameters and which reflects in the Coulomb coupling parameters and the velocity of the particles. Okay, and the la last question is by Pratiksha. At around gamma 200, the crystal melts. What are, what are the factors that would control this value? No, we have the gamma. We, we didn't calculate it from the you know, the information of interparticle distance and the charge and the temperature. We, we, from the, we, we extract the information from directly from the displacement distribution function that can be studied using the Langevin dynamics. Okay. And we found during the, the phase transition, the gamma factor changes few folds that essentially tells it is a really a fast order phase transition. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Pinto. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh,